we are starting a new book tonight. And uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, we're going to undertake a review of what's probably the longest book in the Bible, by some reckoning, a book that is uh, most misunderstood, a book that is written by a person who many scholars consider the most spiritual person in the Old Testament. That's quite a statement. I won't try to defend it. It's just the opinion of some scholars, but it, just to you know, give you some perspective. Book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet. His name, by the way, uh, and of course, as as you are painfully aware, the first evening tends to be just a lot of yak. You know, we'll get we'll get into it. But there's so much background that it's probably uh, good to to cover to give you some perspective. And you'll understand some of our problems as we get in. In fact, that's what I'm going to try to do tonight is give you some overview, some perspective, what we're going to try to get into, and some of the dimensions of, of our exploration in the next uh, uh, number of weeks. Jeremiah's name happens to mean the Lord hurls, throws. It can mean, and is more often quoted as meaning exalts, throws up, holds high. Okay? Jeremiah, the Lord exalts, or pearls. It happens that Jer- the book of Jeremiah, yes, it's a book of prophecy. He is one of the most revered prophets. But it also happens to be one of the most autobiographical books in the Bible. And therefore, we know a great deal about this man. Unlike some of these prophets that we read and enjoy and benefit from, but don't know a lot about, Jeremiah, we're going to discuss, we're going to reach right into his very soul. We're going to understand the man, his feelings, his passions, his intensity, his concern. We're going to, and and fortunately, he also happens to be a, a model for us to follow in the sense that he's deeply spiritual and uncompromising with himself and with his nation Israel. More specifically, the tribe of Judah, the house of Judah. But if I use the term Israel, I'm not using. I'm using it in the generic sense. I, I may slip, so I might say that up front early. That technically, this is obviously. Well, after David, of course, uh, and Solomon, and after Solomon came the civil war, and the civil war divided the nation Israel into two houses: Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And subsequent, the subsequent kings, particularly in the north, went from bad to worse. The northern kingdom, denotatively called Israel, just fell into ruin. Uh, idolatry, uh, each king worse than the previous, and just bad news. Ahab, Jezebel, all of that. And then, uh, but finally, the Assyrians took them captive, and they were made slaves. Judah to the south survived longer. And it's Judah that we're going to be focusing on. If I use the name Israel, it's a slip of the tongue in a sense, because I should be very careful and try to remember to say Judah, because we're speaking of the house of Judah. That is the southern kingdom, the southern half of the nation. Recognize the northern half is already fallen, already gone. But for some substantial period of time, Judah is in better shape, relatively. There are some reforms, and then things deteriorate. Ultimately, the Babylonians do two things. They conquer the Assyrians, so they're on top. They're the world power at the time. And um, But ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is used by God to take Judah captive. And Jeremiah is in the strange position of admonishing his country to surrender, to, to yield to, these, to this Gentile ruler, because Jeremiah says that, This is the instrument of God for judgment on the nation. This was not a popular theme, okay? He was treated as a treasonous uh, person. It's actually more complicated than that, and I'll unravel as we go, but just to give you sort of a superficial overview. And, of course, it's in in Jeremiah's time that uh, Judah falls and the Babylonian captivity begins. This happens to be one of the most important portions of Old Testament history, for Israel, because it's their fall, and it has lots of relevance, both historically and also prophetically, it becomes a very crucial period of time because it's the period of time that Daniel and Ezekiel and many, many prophets, and we'll, I'll try to give that map to you in a minute, 
It's a period of some power changes and things that have profound implications on your understanding of the Bible in general. But let me sort of tip you off in advance. It's also a period of time that will lend itself to you and I of some incredible discoveries relative to our day and Israel today and Jerusalem today and uh, the 70 weeks gets in there on the Daniel side, but there's some other discoveries we'll deal with as we go. Fortunately, the chronology in this period is, is amazingly well documented and that'll turn out to be very meaningful for you and I because the, these, the, we're going to talk about dates, 5600 BC and this year and the summer of this and the spring of that and it's going to impact directly this particular time in which you and I live. It will have echoes in May of 48 and in June of 67 and indeed to you and I in the coming horizon. So it's going to turn out to be a very, very relevant book. But as long as I'm taking the luxury up front of sort of, I'm going to operate as if you're essentially all new and yet I'll forget that and, and, and make references to those of us that have been sort of, the, those of you that have endured, you know, uh, Daniel, Isaiah, Zechariah and some of the others. Um, first of all, if you're taking notes, I'll try not to make this do this. I'll try to do this every time we meet. But in the upper right-hand corner of your notepad, you have to put Acts 17:11. Some I'm going to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and try to get that as a license plate. I think, um, except I can't get the night, enough digits in there. Acts 17:11. That's where Luke tells you not to believe a thing Chuck Missler tells you. You are to receive this with readiness of mind, but to search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. So having warned you of Acts 17.11, not to believe anything I say, my intention will be to share with you lots of background and ideas and thoughts, some of them sound, some of them speculative, but with that license I will allow myself the freedom of moving afield a bit because it's sometimes fun, but trust you as mature growing Christians to not believe anything I say, but check it out. And if I've done nothing else but get you into some fresh reference material, praise God. Now, a couple of other things. I'm still going through bibliographies. I'm dealing with some more than a dozen commentaries. Some are clearly better than others. And as was my style years ago, I'll try to do again as I into this a little bit more. I'll try to prepare a bibliography for those of you that are really anxious to expand your library. The bibliography could list some 30 or 40 books. However, I'll try to focus on one or two that seem to be the most useful. But I'll tell you up front right now, those of you that would like to do collateral reading for these studies, and you get a lot more out of them if you do, I will be sharing with you as we go through passages in Chronicles and Kings, Second Chronicles, Second Kings, that give you the historical background. And as I do that, you can take notes, and I encourage you to read in that general area of Second Chronicles and Kings, typically Second Kings 22, 23, 24 in that range, and Second Chronicles 34, 35 in that range. And your study Bibles will have them, but that... that Second Kings 22, give or take a few chapters, and Second Chronicles 34 and 35, give or take a few chapters, is the general area in which there's enormous historical background. But I'm going to surprise you and suggest an additional book. Those of you that are planning to really sort of hang in there with us during the study of Jeremiah, I'm going to suggest you read a book that's got nothing to do with Jeremiah and yet may have everything to do with God's purpose in the study, and that's to read The Light and the Glory. The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and another guy, I forget the other, David Mangle. Thank you. I, forget, I'm, I apologize to the other guy for not remembering his name, but it's a popular book, and I encourage you to read it. There's several like it, but that's probably the one you best know and would be available in your stores, and it's a book about the United States. And as, you, as we go through Jeremiah, you may understand God's purpose in raising this issue before our attention at this particular time in this particular way. Well, anyway, Jeremiah, most autobiographical. We know more about Jeremiah than any other Old Testament prophet. And that's, but he's also the least read and most misunderstood. We all have sort of an indefinite feeling that, well, he's the weeping prophet. And indeed, you touch his work at any place and it'll weep. There's deep, deep feeling. Um... It's also regarded by many scholars as the most difficult book in the Old Testament for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the arrangement of the chapters. The chapters are not necessarily chronological, and that throws a lot of people. 
even Daniel has 12 chapters. First six are narrative, last six are collection of visions, but they, you can sort of sort that through and get comfortable with it. The Gospels are sort of, well, they're basically, well, we, correction, we sort of assume that they're chronological. They're not really, but some of them are a little, I won't get into that. Um, there are arrangement problems. Uh, chapters 46 through 51 occur before the fall of Jerusalem, which is mentioned in chapter 39. You have to take all this down because we're going to go through this as we go through the chapters, but just to give you sort of an overview. So 46 to through 51 are not, uh, even though they're near the end of the book, they occur, they deal with events that occurred before chapter 39. Chapters 37 through 44 do seem to be consecutive. Chapters 50 and 51 are special problems we'll deal with, and there's a very special problem with chapter 52 which is, uh, uh, again, things, all these things we'll deal with as we get there. But just up front, I should let you know, we're going to find that there are some scholastic arrangement problems. However, the answer is very simple, and that's just to take it chapter by chapter and don't struggle with the arrangement, struggle with what he's saying, and, and let the Holy Spirit deal with that. But there are some arrangement problems. There's another thing that some people regard as a problem, but fortunately I don't think really turns out to be, and that is to really understand Jeremiah you do need to have an awful lot of history, extra biblical background. The good news, it's very well documented in the scripture and also through all kinds of archaeological discoveries. We understand pretty well what happened in that period. And when you understand the flow of the kings and the powers and things, the book of Jeremiah will mean a lot to, more to you. Sometimes when you take a book, you have some historical background, but it's just a flourish. It's a little just sort of flavor. Other times, and this is one of them, it really will help to have a, a feeling for what's going on, and I'll try to give you some background. Fortunately, it's dramatic enough and understandable enough that I think it'll, it, uh, it should be pretty interesting. Uh, it is the longest book in the Bible, and it's regarded by many as the most valuable. Now, in the Hebrew canon, the Old Testament is divided into three groups, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And the prophets were divided into the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets included the books of Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, and Kings, which may surprise you because we normally don't think of that, but that's the way they were grouped. And the latter prophets included the major, what we call the major and minor prophets, not counting Lamentations and Daniel. They were classified differently. But at the head of the scroll of the latter prophets was Jeremiah. It was the lead book of what was called the Latter Prophets. That may explain a little problem that we have in Matthew 27, 9 that we talked about before. I talked about the arrangement thing. Let's talk a little bit about what you can expect in the style. Jeremiah is as opposite from Isaiah as you can imagine. Isaiah was elegant, lofty, uh, fabulous, fabulous writer, but with a very high style. Jeremiah is the opposite. He is very direct. He is very simple, but as a result, very vivid, um, very unornamented in contrast to Isaiah, but he's very incisive and clear. He has a lot of poetry and it's very lyrical, but it's still very direct. Heavy use of nature. He's a very, he's a man of the earth. As I mentioned, he's called the weeping prophet. He is extremely tender, sympathetic, will express almost continually, a deep anguish of soul. This is not casual stuff. It is the very fiber of his being, and yet will come through, even in our translations. A couple of other things you might be intrigued to know is there are 66 passages in the book from the book of Deuteronomy. And that becomes particularly provocative when you recognize that it was during his ministry that the book of the law was discovered in the temple. They came from an apostate background. The previous kings were idolatrous. There's a reform. And one of the things that happens during the reform is that in one of the storerooms, chambers somewhere, tucked away, lost, they discovered the law. Book of Deuteronomy. That has a big impact. Well, there are 66 passages of Deuteronomy in it. Uh, references to the Job and Psalms, in effect. Lots of um, uh, indebtedness in the minds of some scholars to Hosea. Uh, it's quoted over 50 times. Book of Jeremiah is quoted over 50 times in the New Testament and over half of those in the book of Revelation. So as students of prophecy, that should immediately get your attention. Okay. And he is regarded by some of the more learned scholars as one of the greatest spiritual giants of all time. That's quite a statement to speak of someone in the Bible because there's some pretty good guys in the Bible. Jeremiah does pretty well. 
Okay, uh, now we speak of prophets all the time. One of the things that is worth sort of having in view is that the 8th and 7th and half of the 6th century B.C., in other words, from 800 through, call it 650, which remember, they're going downhill, we're B.C., right, in minus numbers, if you will. Um, there was a galaxy of prophets in Israel. Zephaniah, Obadiah, and a gal by the name of Huldah, the prophetess, were contemporaries of Jeremiah in Judah. Zephaniah, Obadiah, and Huldah. And we'll speak of Huldah superficially. She shows up in 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34. She's a very well-known prophetess in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was from Anathoth and the early stages, a little, you know, not in the, the main limelight. He, that quickly changes. And now, we're going to be in that period of time when Judah goes into captivity. During the captivity, there's also three prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Daniel's deported as a teenager. Ezekiel in the second siege. And then, of course, uh, Jeremiah. There are apparently about 18 points of contact between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, so that's no surprise. Also, Nahum and Habakkuk are contemporaries at this time, approximately. Now, now comes the part that I, I'm, I'm, I'm resisting strongly, the temptation of used view graphs or blackboards, because, first of all, not everybody can see them, and it really screws up the tape, I see. So, and, you know, then Doug gets bothered with letters from, say, where can I get the drawings? And so we're going to try to do this verbally, and yet at the same time, bear with me, because what I want you to have a perspective of are a, is a period of time that will span five kings, Three of them are very important. Two of them only reign three months. They're important, but they don't do that much damage in three months. But there's five kings. The first one I want you to sort of feel you know is Josiah. Josiah the king. He reigned from about 639 to 609. I don't think you have to drop, you don't have to jot all these numbers down unless you're just like to do that sort of thing. But Josiah reigned for, for about uh, 30 years, 639 to 609. Now, Josiah was a good guy. Josiah had a, a real desire. Prior to him, there was um, well, Hezekiah, and then he, he was a good guy. Then he was followed by Manasseh, who was bad news. He's the one that's reputed, through tradition at least, to have sawn Isaiah in half and all of that. Bad scene. Josiah comes on the scene, and he's very positive. And I'll talk more about these kings in a minute, but first of all, I'll give you a perspective. Under the reign of Josiah, who's basically a good guy, he's reigning about 10 years when Jeremiah is called. Jeremiah is about 20 at the time when he's called as a prophet. So Jeremiah was 10 when Josiah takes rulership. So even as a small child, he had some exposure to the bad news that preceded Josiah. He probably clearly had the uh, opportunity to, to understand this good king coming on board who started to, to try to straighten out the land. I'll give you more background in his reign in a minute. But then Jeremiah gets called about 629. It's about 15, 17 years later that Nineveh falls. Bear in mind, we're in the southern kingdom. Josiah is doing some reforms. The northern kingdom has fallen to the Assyrians, but they're starting to face pressure from this rising power that's a, it's actually far to the east, but you'll always hear it spoken of as if it's to the north, and that may puzzle you. When you read the Bible, you wonder, when Babylon threatens Jerusalem, it's from the north, and you say, that's kind of crazy. Well, there's an Arabian desert that causes them to go north and then south, so they're coming to, whenever they attack Jerusalem, they attack from the north. Even though they're, you know, a couple hundred miles, their headquarters, Babylon is a couple hundred, if you look at a map, you know, it's several hundred miles to the east. But the path to get to Jerusalem is actually a northerly passage, okay? So the, the tra if you understand the topography of the land, the geography of the land, uh, they come from the north. And, and Israel was like a land bridge between that northern area and Egypt. So as Egypt and whoever, be it Babylon or Assyria or the Romans, Wherever the war is going on, Israel's right in the passageway. And whoever is taking over is trampling through their yards. So that's why the whole history is one of, of uh, traffic. I suppose there's an analogy with Poland and Europe or something. But uh, the net of it is is that uh, they're right in the traffic pattern. And, of course, in, uh, prior to Jeremiah, Assyria is the dominant power, has taken over the northern kingdom. But Assyria now is starting to face this growing power, there's really three major powers, if you think of it that way, Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt. 
and uh, they're fighting with each other, aligning with each other, and whatever. But Babylon's gradually starting to get powerful. Uh, Nineveh falls in 612 during Josiah's reign. He dies at Megiddo in 609 B.C. And Jehoiakim has is on the throne for three months. And then Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim will be followed by Jehoiachin. That's what, so I'm going to mispronounce it a little bit to emphasize Jehoiakin and Jehoiachin, two different guys. Jehoiakim is the one that gives Jeremiah the toughest time. And it's also through during his reign that there's this most important battle in that part of the country, uh, the Battle of Karshemesh. And that's where the Assyrian Empire falls. They had been allied with the Egyptians. Pharaoh Necho is defeated at, uh, uh, by the Chaldeans and the Medes. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar, his general of the army, makes that battle. It also happens that back home his dad dies. He's now king of the world. And uh, that's when things get kind of rough um, as far as... Uh, Judah's concerned because the Babylonians are used by God to to punish Judah for their sin. And it's Jeremiah's burden to keep reminding the people uh, to repent, but they don't, and God had pronounced judgment and falls. Under Jehoiakim, uh, as I said, is the Battle of Karshmish, and then starts what's really three sieges of Jerusalem. And this is important to try to understand. Jehoiakim reigns from 609 to 597, when uh, the Battle of Karshemesh takes place and Nebuchadnezzar succeeds in defeating Pharaoh Necho, the, the, the ally of the Assyrians, Egypt, Egyptian ally. Uh, at that time, on his, you know, he, he lays siege to Jerusalem. That's the first of three sieges of Jerusalem. It's in that siege that certain nobles are exiled, including Daniel. That's when Daniel gets deported to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar puts up in office a guy by the name of Jehoiah Chin. And he is also bad news. He's such bad news that Jeremiah pronounces a blood curse on him. God puts a blood curse on the royal line. And we'll talk about that a lot when we get there. And Jehoiah Chin intrigues, tries to adopt a pro-Egypt policy against the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar takes a dim view of that. That leads to the second siege of Jerusalem, where um, Ezekiel is exiled. That's why Ezekiel, that's how he gets to Babylon. He does his writings while in Babylon. And it's in Ahijah Chin that is, is, is replaced with uh, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah reigns for um, about, about 17 years, 18 years. And uh, Zedekiah also does some poor politics and intrigues with Nebuchadnezzar's enemies. Nebuchadnezzar now has about a belly full of all of this. And he has the third siege of Jerusalem. And that's where he levels it and takes them all captives and destroys the temple. And then he appoints a governor of Gedalia. And uh, so that's the the rough era from Josiah all the way through Zedekiah. There's actually five kings, but two only serve three months each. And so there's actually three kings that are very, very major, very important to understand, and we'll talk more about as we go. Now, as I said, Jeremiah's call is about... 629 B.C. It's about four years after Jeremiah starts in service as a prophet that there is a guy by the name of Nabopolassar. He's from a province called Chaldea, southern province of Babylon, and he emerges to power. And he reigns until the Battle of Karshemesh and the fall of the Assyrian Empire. It happens that that's where he dies. He doesn't, not in the battle, but he dies. His son, Nebuchadnezzar, technically Nebuchadnezzar II, and incidentally, more properly, it's Nebuchadrezzar is a proper way. It's been mistransliterated for years, but I'm not going to try to change because we all know him as a Nebuchadnezzar. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar uh, carries it through about, to about 562. I want to make sure, I want to talk a little bit more about Josiah. He took the throne when he was eight years old. Okay. And he reigned for uh, till he was about 38. He reigned for 30 years. One thing you should understand, to be in fairness here, when, when Josiah takes the throne, up until then, Assyria had been very strong, so strong they took the northern kingdom captive. The previous kings to Josiah introduced increasing amounts of Assyrian elements in their worship, idolatry. 
On the one hand, Josiah takes charge as a king, and he under, God calls him to undertake reforms. Now, what God's also doing is he's raising to strength the Babylonians to the south that are putting pressure on Assyria. And that gives Judah, which is one of these small states in between all these world politics, more freedom. With Assyria having problems with Babylon, there's more opportunity for Judah to throw off, get rid of some of these Assyrian practices. And, and uh, it's about six years into his reign where uh, Josiah seeks the Lord, according to Second Chronicles 34, and his reforms begin about four years later. In other words, he's, in, he's, he's into this in reign about 10 years. He's about 18 starting to really come of feel his strength, and that's when he under, starts undertaking some dramatic re, uh, reforms. It also happens, the Lord provides, that the book of the law was discovered in the temple a few years later. That's in Second Kings 22 and Second Chronicles 34. I won't give you the verses. Give the chapters. You can find it. And the reforms that we're talking about are detailed in Second Kings 22 and 23. And it's in this background that Jeremiah is emerging as, as a prophet. The reforms of Jeremiah did not really last they were a good beginning, but they didn't really stick. And we have evidence of that, if nothing else, by Jeremiah's ceaseless uh, condemnation of Judah's sin. As we go through the book of Jeremiah, he's just not going to let go of the fact that Judah is sinning and that God is going to use. And he also admonishes them to stay out of this world politics. They keep dabbling in it. And, of course, God uses their enemies to bring his judgment. Okay, in 609, the, Pharaoh, the Battle of Karshmish, we talked about... Oh, correction, no, in 609 is when Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, the same guy, um, he joins Assyria as an ally. Josiah starts to interfere with this. Pharaoh Necho warns him not to, but he doesn't listen. And there's a battle at Megiddo, the same place that gives the name to the area of Armageddon. Uh, it's at Megiddo that King Josiah gets killed. And that's a major tragedy for Judah. Uh, what's happening here is that Babylon, though, is be starting to get stronger than Egypt. And that's going to prove very critical shortly under this Nabopolassar of Chaldea. Um, Nabopolassar took, took charge. Now we're going to shift and talk to the Babylonian kings. Nabopolassar took charge about 625 B.C., but he gets strong enough to destroy Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, in 612. So it's his son... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar II that defeats Pharaoh Necho in the famous Battle of Karshemesh near the Euphrates River at 605 B.C. You'll find that in uh, Jeremiah 46 and Second Chronicles 35. But the important part of that battle, that's when Babylon rules the world. Now, with Josiah getting killed, he's a popular guy. He was, he was, he was a real leader. Uh, the, the people are really distraught. And they take matters in their own hands. And they set Jehoahaz on the throne. He's the son of Josiah, but not the oldest son. He only reigns three months, and that's why you don't find much of him in the scripture. Uh, he tends to have an anti-Egypt, pro-Babylonian policy, but uh, that was uh, probably, uh, he shouldn't be dabbling because Pharaoh Necho in Egypt thinks that's kind of, he doesn't like that kind of a policy. So Pharaoh Necho depo does four things. He deposes him, um, in 2 Kings 23, by the way. He takes him to Egypt. He exacts tribute from Judah. And what Pharaoh Necho arranges, he sets the oldest son of Josiah, who happens to be this guy's half-brother, whose name is Eliakim, but he changes the name to Jehoiakim. That's the one with a K. Okay, Jehoiakim. This is all in Second Kings 23 and Second Chronicles 36, for those of you that want to dig into that. Now, Jehoiakim is, is very important. He reigns 11 years, and it's his reign that gives Jeremiah his greatest trial and um, opposition. He and Jeremiah are totally at opposite ends on every subject. Religion, politics, you name it. Jeremiah is obviously calling for reforms. Jehoiakim ignores it. Jeremiah tries to point out that God is raising Babylon to judge Judah. And Jehoiakim ignores that and wants to resist Babylon and play intrigues with Egypt and gets himself in all kinds of trouble. Jehoiakim, though, so I want you to have some impressions of these because we're going to start getting into all that as we go through the book. He is the worst and most ungodly of all Judah's kings. He's bloodthirsty. He's the enemy of the truth. He was totally uncaring uh, relative to the worship of God, of the God of Israel. Um, he ex extracted exorbitant taxes, used forced labor without pay, just 
a bad dude. Um, 605 was the Battle of Karshemish, as I say, and that's which caused a, cha a major change in the, in the power structure there. When that happens, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem and makes Jehoiakim a vassal of the king. In other words, yes, he's still king, but he's, he's under uh, Nebuchadnezzar. The nobles are then exiled, which include Daniel. I mentioned that. This date, the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, where Jehoiakim is, you know, loses, is the first siege of the three, and it starts a period of time called the servitude of the nation. It was prophesied to last 70 years. It lasts 70 years to the very day. And when the time comes, we'll get into that. The second siege will occur, then the third siege is where Nebuchadnezzar has a belly full of levels it, that's under Zedekiah and all of that, and destroys it. The third siege is about 19 years after, the, the period of time from the first to the third siege, while all this is going on, is about 19 years. And I'm going to link up later when we get into this, the, the, I'll point out to you that the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar starts the period known as the servitude of the nation its last, its last 70 years. There's also a period in prophecy called the uh, desolations of Jerusalem. They're also prophesied to be 70 years. And most scholars get those two mixed up. The servitude of the nation starts at the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, in my personal opinion, and many opinions. That's not mine alone. The servitude of the nation and the desolations of Jerusalem are not coterminous. Many scholars presume they are, but if you look carefully, they're not. Because Jerusalem continues to exist for those 19 years. It's a vassal city. In the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Jerusalem is destroyed. That starts a period of time called the desolations of Jerusalem. And the desolations of Jerusalem are also predicted to be 70 years. Everybody assumes it's the same 70-year period. It's not. Later on, when the Jews are released from the Babylonian captivity and go home, they can go home, but they don't have the authority to rebuild the city. The rebuilding of the city, not the temple, the city, is the main trigger point in the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. That occurs later under Nehemiah and all of that. Now, there is a prophecy we'll explore later at the right time, which talks about 2,484 years, two months, and three days, and all of that, and we'll get into that. But if you start that reckoning from the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, the servitude of the nation, you come, it ends up pointing to May 14th of 1948 when the nation is regathered in the land. Nineteen years after the first siege, the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, if you count that same period of time there, which triggers the desolations of the city of Jerusalem, you come to June of 1967 when Jerusalem was back under the Star of David for the first time since Christ's crucifixion. So I'm going to suggest speculatively... I don't know that this is right. I'm just making observa observations that these things seem to fit. Now, if that's true, then the prophecies and the relevance of these milestones and dates and sieges have enormous significance to you and I as we try to understand what God is doing in Israel today. To understand that, you should understand what God was doing in Israel then. So there is a prophetic outline reason for understanding Jeremiah. There's a personal reason for understanding Jeremiah is to understand his walk and his source of energy and, and how he withstood his incredible circumstances. But there's also a national reason to understand Jeremiah, and we'll get to that too. Getting back to Jehoiakim, this 11-year reign of this bad guy, he sponsors idolatry, widespread injustice. He's the inveterate foe of God and his word. And his revolt, uh, obviously, is unsuccessful and leads to the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Jeremiah, during this time, is persecuted, plotted against, uh, maligned, and finally imprisoned. Uh, the king, Jehoiakim, destroys his prophecies. Takes the book, destroys it. It's later replaced. And that may account for some of the reasons why it's not chronological. It's he and Baruch, his scribe and secretary, you know, replace it subsequently. During all these troubles, Jeremiah does not swerve from a commitment before the Lord. He has an unpopular theme. He's, he's a deep, deep feeling patriot. And yet uh, he has to see his nation sin, refuse to repent, and fall under God's judgment, not heeding his continual impassioned um, admonitions. Jehoiakim uh, dies violently in Jerusalem after his 11-year rule. Um, just as, as Jer Jeremiah predicts, he will predict that and it, follow, it happens that way. And he's replaced by Jehoiachin, his son. 
Now, Jehiah Chin gives you the additional complication. He and at least none of these guys only reigns three months. I think he also was a teenager, although we're a little not clear on that one. He is also known as Jeconiah, or, and sometimes shows up in um, Jeremiah as Coniah, C-O-N-I-H. Unless it's pointed out to you through a study Bible or something, you'd have no way of following all this. But Jehoiah Chin or, or Jeconiah is the one that the, Jeremiah also denounces and, in fact, ultimately, under the Lord's direction, pronounces a blood curse. And that creates all kinds of messianic line problems that we'll talk about when we get there. Uh, this teenage king, Jehoiah Chin, is also a wicked monarch. It's his father's rebellion, even though he, he died violently, but it was his father's rebellion that, he, that he'd started that causes Nebuchadnezzar to siege Jerusalem the second time. Uh, Jeconiah, or Jehiah Chin, uh, capitulates. Uh, he's exiled to Babylon along with a lot of nobles. That's when the, the temple is plundered. That's when Ezekiel is also taken captive and, and so forth. And uh, the king, uh, Jehiah Chin, is exiled in Babylon for 37 years. He's enslaved in Babylon uh, there. He's finally released by Evil Merodach, that's his name, E-V-I-L hyphen Merodach, who's a son and successor to Nebuchadnezzar by then. Belshazzar in the handwriting of the wall really wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's son, it was his grandson. So that's confusing because in the, in the old languages you don't have this great-grandson concept, they just have son. Son doesn't necessarily mean adjacent son, it just means successor. See? So, but the immediate successor was Evil Merodach, and I believe it was his son that is Bel. Belshazzar, the, the guy that is presiding when uh, Cyrus the Persian conquers Babylon. That's later, of course, obviously. It's interesting that Ezekiel, when he refers to the king, he refers to Jeconiah, not Zedekiah. When, Je when Ezekiel is in Babylon, his king, evil though he was, was Jehoiachin. And it's interesting that he makes that reference, not to Zedekiah. That leads us then, when Nebuchadnezzar has the second siege and takes this guy captive, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, quite a character. He was uh, a kingmaker. <laughs> He finds a guy by the name of Mataniah, who is also a son of Josiah. Remember, going back, Josiah the good king, all these bad news guys were brothers or half-brothers, but were all sons of Josiah. He finds uh, a son of Josiah. It's a full brother of Eliakim. That's the one whose name was changed to Jehoiakim. He's the uncle of Jehoiachin, the guy that was the, just deported. His uncle is a guy by the name of Mataniah. Nebuchadnezzar changes his name to Zedekiah. Now, if you're not confused by anything, I thought it was too simple if I just give you a few things. Now, Zedekiah, we're going to hear a lot about. Zedekiah is the king that um, is installed in the second siege. Doesn't do too well and ends up falling in the third and final siege. Zedekiah is pretty close to Jeremiah. That's the good news. The bad news is he's a weakling, no strength. And he, although he tries to help, it's a cowardly, useless way and doesn't accomplish much. But we're going to hear a lot about Zedekiah. Interestingly enough, this whole business of the son of Josiah and Eliakim and having his name changed over is confirmed by the Babylonian Chronicles, which are archaeological finds. In fact, the Babylonian Chronicles and the Lashish letters are major finds that give us all this background. It confirms all this stuff. If you're interested in this thing, there is a book published in 1956 by the London Museum called The Chronicles of the Chaldean Kings, 626 to 556 B.C. in the British Museum by D.J. Weissman. And it's a thorough archaeological confirmation of this whole business that I'm going through. So um, uh, it's, we're building this from Second Kings and Second Chronicles, essentially, but it's also kind of interesting. There's a lot of archaeological support for the period we're talking about. Um, but getting back to Zedekiah, weak, vacillating, deficient, a puppet of Babylon. Now, here's what makes it a mess. He's a puppet of Nebuchadnezzar out of Babylon, but his first string guys, you know, his officials, are all pro-Egypt. So even though he's a puppet of Babylon and tries to do what Babylon tells him, his first string fight him. And he's too weak to do anything about it. And so nothing gets done. Because official policy is obviously pro-Babylonian. But his second tier are pro the Babylonian enemies, namely Egypt. And so that caused it to be a mess. And these officials are the ones, since they're pro-Egypt, when Jeremiah runs around advocating from a theological position a pro-Babylonian view, they uh, uh, you know, climb all over him. They give him all kinds of problems. So even though King Zedekiah is pro-Babylon, and Jeremiah's message from God is that, hey, the Babylonians are God's instrument. Don't fight them. You, this is God's way of judging Judah. 
the second string who are pro-Egypt say that's treason and that's where Jeremiah gets in all these problems that you're going to see. So Zedekiah is close to Jeremiah but powerless. He doesn't help much. Uh, in the fourth year of uh, Zedekiah's reign, he plots against Babylon with the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. Now that's bad company. If you know anything about Israel's history, you know, getting into treaties with Edom of all people, Moab, Ammon, uh, well, Tyre and Sidon, well, it's just, you know, it's a mess. And so they plot. Jeremiah denounces the whole mess, and of course it comes to nothing. In the ninth year, Zedekiah uh, again conspires with Pharaoh Hophra. This is a succeeding Pharaoh with the Egyptian against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar takes a dim view of this, and so the city falls in the summer of 86. And that's all in 2 Kings 24, 2 Chronicles 36. And Jeremiah will talk a lot about it from chapter 38 through 39. We'll get to that when the time comes. During this period, Jeremiah urges surrender to, to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the Egyptian forces show up for a while, Babylonians withdraw, but then they come back and they finally level the place. Zedekiah is very, who uh, tries to support uh, Jeremiah, doesn't do anything effective, and Jeremiah's enemies mistreat him badly. And so he's a victim of all of that. But finally, in 586, comes the fall of Jerusalem. It's celebrated to, annually by the Jews on the morning of 9th of Ab. But the year was 586. Now, Zedekiah tries to escape. We're going to discover one of the most interesting prophecies in the Bible because Ezekiel and Jeremiah both prophesy about Zedekiah. And one of them says that um, he will never see the Babylonian captivity, and the other one says that he will die in Babylon. And the taunts are made by the second tier. You guys can't even agree. Can't even get your story straight. Because here's Zedekiah. One guy says he's going to die in Babylon. The other guy says he's never going to see Babylon. Make up your mind, guys. Well, when the fall of Jerusalem occurs, Zedekiah tries to escape. They catch him. And they put chains on him. The first thing they do is they bring his sons in front of him. They slaughter all of them, then put his eyes out, and then carry him to Babylon in chains. And then you go back and read the prophecies. With, and you, back here, neck takes a creep because it's very. you read the fine print. He never saw the Babylonian captivity, though he died there. So you begin to realize you take prophecy literally. Of course, Peter told you to do that. You remember Noah got the promise by God that he'd never again destroy the world with a flood. Peter says, wait a minute, read the fine print by water. It's going to be another flood. It'll be by fire. He tells you to read the, read the small print. So anyway, Zedekiah. Now Zedekiah is taken away in chains. Um, Nebuchadnezzar appoints Gedaliah as appointed governor. He's murdered by uh, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, who is uh, of the Davidic house. Big plot, assassination. And of course, it comes to nothing. But the rebels, the people that were involved in that mess, flee to Egypt for refuge from Nebuchadnezzar. And they force Jeremiah and Baruch, his secretary, to go with them. And that's how Jeremiah, the great irony is, here's Jeremiah, who's always preached against Egypt, pro-Babylon, pro now forced in exile in Egypt of all places. There's a tradition that some of the men in Egypt in the town there stoned Jeremiah. There's another tradition, a rabbinical tradition, that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar ultimately defeats Egypt, takes Egypt over. Jeremiah predicts that. Nebuchadnezzar does. The rabbinical tradition has Nebuchadnezzar deporting Jeremiah back to Babylon after his conquest of uh, he and Baruch both back to Babylon. We're not sure exactly. We have, we still, we're lacking as much evidence as we'd like on exactly what happens to Jeremiah. There are some bizarre traditions that he ended up going to England, and these traditions are all tangled up with the so-called Ten Lost Tribes. Uh, don't, get tra don't fall into that trap. There are no Ten Lost Tribes. First of all, when the northern house was going apostate, the faithful went south, so the tribes were merged anyway. But the northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria, which got conquered by Babylon, who then conquered Judah. So the, the slaves were all merged together. Proof of that is in Chronicles, but it's also, you'll notice the letters. Peter writes to the 12 tribes of Israel. And you'll find again and again the 12 tribes are treated as 12 tribes. The concept of 10 lost tribes is a fiction of literature. It is not biblical. It is contrary to God's teaching. It happens to be used by some to promote the most bizarre theology. But uh, don't fall into that trap. And I won't spend any more time on that here. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Jeremiah personally. He was the son of a guy by the name of Hilkiah, who was of a priestly family, but not in Jerusalem, in Anathoth. Now, it is believed by most scholars that this Hilkiah is the same Hilkiah that found the book of the law in the temple. We read in 2 Kings 22 that it is a priest by the name of Hilkiah that happens to find the, the book of the law, and it's, I believe it's the book of Deuteronomy, in the temple. 
This Hilkiah is a descendant of Abiathar, which is the sole survivor of the priests of Nob from 1 Samuel 22, who after ministering to David was exiled by Solomon to Anathoth, exactly where Jeremiah was raised. Uh, he apparently had property there, according to 1 Kings 2, that is, Abiathar did. Uh, let's see. Now, since Jeremiah raised in Anathoth, it's one reason he wasn't as visible for as holder the prophetess was in Jerusalem, but that gets fixed later. He was not married. Uh, he was called in 626. He had 40 years of service as a prophet. His closest companion is Baruch, uh, the son of uh, Neriah, who is a scribe and a secretary. And... Um, there are probably two major, several major themes besides just his personal walk and his personal passion to be faithful to God. His basic premise, I submit to you, is that only faithfulness to God can guarantee a nation's security. Only faithfulness to God can guarantee a nation's security. And his message is probably more desperately needed in our land today than most of you have the opportunity to know. The United States today is in desperate shape. We used to be, we are the first time in our history a debtor nation. Our trade deficit is several hundred billion a year where our trading partners have trading surpluses, so as time goes, they get stronger, we get weaker. Our federal budget is at a deficit, which is going to force, ultimately, hair-curling inflation and all the attendant disruption that causes. Our military predicament is more serious than we are generally allowed to understand from a very liberal press. Our Navy is facing a Navy several times its size with more advanced equipment. Our army is facing an army enormously disadvantaged. Our strategic situation is so absurd that it's to, to really get scary. We're facing a very, very serious situation. You look at this country morally, and it's a disaster. You, and, and I mean, you can talk about AIDS and some of those things if you like. You can look everywhere you like. Whether you look at crime rates, morality in general, or just business practices, it's tragic. Even at the most fundamental, simple level, there is no concept of the sanctity of a commitment of any kind, be it a business contract or a marriage vow. This country is in serious, serious shape because it has forgotten its covenant, the covenant upon which it was founded, the covenant that uh, God gave the beginners who settled this land, who set it up in his grace and gave him the glory and made every move throughout its history, up until recent years, uh, with uh, some form of acknowledgement to the, the, the God that had ordained this country. Now, uh, our problems in this country are serious, desperate, and so on. Our answers are no different than the ones that Jeremiah had laid out by the grace of God before Judah. Judah was facing its enemies, we're facing ours. And make no mistake, they're enemies. They're armed, they're technologically sophisticated, and they are committed to a preemptive strike when they feel they can pull it off. We know that. The press won't deal with that, but uh, the experts know that. So we've got serious problems. But the answers to those problems are not defense budgets. It's not politicians. It's not elections. It's in your prayer closet. It's in getting a revival, getting this country spiritually on track again. The problems today are solved the same way that they were then. Only faithfulness to God can guarantee a nation's security. Something else that shows up in all of these things that I think, find fascinating, we constantly read about idolatry. You know, Josiah got rid of it, and they came back in idolatry. And you and I tend to probably take the shrug of our shoulders because we don't think of idols as something we light candles to or kneel before. Or something. We, don't, we don't think of idolatry in its classical pagan forms. It's all over us anyway. We just need to get to recognize it perhaps more precisely. But the interesting thing is, is that idolatry is always associated with immorality. When idolatry overtakes the land, immorality followed, and vice versa. When immorality takes over the land, idolatry follows. And I don't think that formula has changed. As we understand Jeremiah better, we'll, understand, we'll see with a total, totally new perception 
what's going on around us. Now, I will surprise most of you by getting actually into the chapter tonight. <laughs> Won't that be fun? Jeremiah. Okay, I, I, I apologize for trying to wander through all that material rather pedantically up front. You don't need to remember it all, but as we go, at least some of that will start to come together for you, I hope. And uh, let's move on. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, period. The words of Jeremiah, that's strange. Let's say the word of the Lord as given to Jeremiah. He says the words of Jeremiah and then goes on. Now, in a sense, that's convenient for us because he doesn't limit his narrative to that, the words that the Lord gave him in a direct sense. It's the words of Jeremiah. In addition to the words that the Lord gives him, you're going to discover he is very free with autobiographical background, how he felt, what he did, and so forth, for which I think we can be grateful. Sometimes when we have just the words of the Lord per se, we sometimes wish we had more context, more perception of what was going on. In Jeremiah, that won't be too much of a problem. We're going to have an abundance of insight into the politics of the time, the context in which he's dealing. And perhaps most important for all of us is what was really going on in Jeremiah's life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I take the entire book as inspired. Don't misunderstand my remarks. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, and that's the Hilkiah that we, uh, as I mentioned, is the one that we believe was the same Hilkiah that was accredited with having found the, uh, this discovering, this famous missing, you know, they, they had so forgotten the God of Israel. They actually discovered a book of the law in the temple. Now you first think, wow, I mean, that's almost laughable. And yet that shows you how destitute they were of uh, orthodox practices during Josiah's reign. It was his encouragement that they came back. So Josiah is a good guy, and that's when this all starts here. The priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Benjamin is quite a place. Borders in the south of Judah and to the north of Ephraim. It's the buffer state, if you will, between Israel and Judah. It gave us a lot of things. It gave us Saul, and it gave us two Sauls. King Saul, succeeded by David, and Saul, succeeding by himself, as Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Benjamin. Roughnecks, tough guys. Tradition of pretty aggressive characters. To whom the word of the Lord came. And that's, of course, the important issue. In the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And the words of the king Josiah, even though some of his reforms obviously didn't last, didn't take hold, he's a good guy. In fact, uh, I can't help but be impressed with the product of his reign. It produced Jeremiah, it was when he came and called and prospered, in a, in a spiritual sense, and also Daniel. Bear in mind, Daniel deported as a teenager, but who, who was he impressed by? Josiah. You may not know a lot about the guy, but you can inspect his fruits. And I'd say that between Daniel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and whatever, we got some pretty good company. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. In other words, his words of Jeremiah, from when? From these days, but also... In the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, skipping ahead to the end. See, all these characters were sons of Josiah. Remember, I went through the five kings, Josiah and then the four others. The four others were sons of, even though their names were changed by Nebuchadnezzar and all stuff, they're all sons of Josiah. And uh, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. And that's not the first siege, that's the last siege we're talking about. There are a couple of first siege with some deportations, but the city as a lock, stock, and barrel shut down in the third siege. So this is sort of an overview, if you will, of his call and his scope. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee, in the womb I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Four things there, gang. He knew, formed, consecrated, and appointed. 
Can you imagine God saying that to you? Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Before I formed thee. How about you? Is that true of you? I wouldn't build my case from this verse, but I can from other places in Scripture support the view that God says that to you this evening. He knows how many hairs on your head are numbered. And if you're like me, that's a moving target. <laughs> Do you know how many hairs are on your head? Do you really? I don't think so. He knows more about you than you do to a little greater level of detail. And I, obviously not the trivial things like how many hairs in your head, but the trivial things he also knows, Scripture tells us. When did he know those things? He has no mass. He's not constricted with time. He's outside the time domain. So he knew those things before Genesis 1, verse 2. He knew them a long time ago. Before you sinned, before Adam sinned, he provided the remedy by making a deal with our Savior, the everlasting covenant. That deal was struck before the early verses in Genesis. But he says, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Whoa. What do you mean sanctify? Fancy word. Excuse the pun, a sanctimonious word. What, what do we mean by sanctified? What a fabulous word. It means only means set aside. Set aside for holy purposes. That's all the word sanctified means. Set apart for holy service. Well, I thought you sanctified when he gets the Holy Spirit. Well, God says he must have had that when he was, before he came out of the womb. I won't build any doctrine on that one. That's just what God is saying to Jeremiah. When were you sanctified? Did God set you apart for holy service? If you've committed yourself to Jesus Christ, he has. And if you have, and he saved you, I submit he wasn't surprised. <laughs> he knew that up front. How far up front? <laughs> A long time ago, before he came out of the womb. So when were you sanctified? I'm not going to get into a lot of New Testament doctrine there. I'm, raise I'm just raising questions, okay? I think I could defend in a biblical debate that you were sanctified independent of time. Because I don't think you were sanctified by something you did. I think you were sanctified by something he did. And he did it. Well, whenever he did it, it's done. I mean, it's done before he did it because he's going to do it. <laughs> and he talks that way. In the Old Testament, you find prophecies described in the past tense. That's disturbing to a beginning Bible student because it's like, you know, he's done this. But it ain't going to happen for another thousand years. That's okay. He's done it because he's done it, you know. So let it be written, so let it be done kind of thing. Before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Can God say that to you? I think so. If you're in Jesus Christ. If you're not in Jesus Christ, it's our collective prayer that you will be. And so he has. You just haven't found out yet. <laughs> Boy, we can get Calvinistic here if we're not careful, so I'll keep moving. <laughs> And I ordained thee a prophet into the nations. Are you a prophet? Probably. If you really know what a prophet is. Called out to foretell God's plan. A prophet doesn't talk about the future. He talks about the whole view of God's dealing. The part that fascinates us is the part that's coming. Because we sort of figure history we can learn. We like to find the history that's written in advance. That's what we jointly define as prophecy. It's not a bad definition. But a prophet is more than just a fortune teller. He's really a forth teller. Tells forth God's word. Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Wow. That's quite a call. Quite a call. So that run over time, I won't chase it down. You might find those of you that are diligent students, the word might find it fun to contract, to compare this with the call of Amos in Amos chapter 7. You'll find parallels. And you can contrast this with the calls of Isaiah and Ezekiel. Isaiah and Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel in chapter 1. Amos in, in chapter 7, Isaiah in chapter 6, and Ezekiel in chapter 1 are their calls. Those of you that are diligent students of prophecy might want to be a diligent student of prophets. And if you're interested in prophets, you can compare calls. There's something to be learned there, but I'll leave that uh, up to you. Now, the one thing that does begin to show up in, chapter, in verse 5 of chapter 1 that will be a vivid theme throughout the entire book of Jeremiah 
is relationship. You're going to discover, if you're attentive, that Jeremiah has a relationship with the Lord. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And uh, knowing the book ain't enough, you need to know its author. And that's what Jeremiah clearly does, and he covets it, develops it, is faithful to it. It's the most important thing in his life, is his relationship. And it's a coupling between his relationship with the Lord and his relationship with his nation. He's close to the Lord, and that leads him to do some surprising things. He calls down vengeance on his enemies. Many scholars are really troubled by some passages in Jeremiah. They think it's very, very ungodly. Some of the things Jeremiah says, they fail to really perceive where he's coming from and, and what he's really saying. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. So Jeremiah doesn't pull his punches. He is passionate and forthright and direct. Our kind of guy. A relationship, like any relationship, is of, is, is of God's doing. Because he knew, he formed, he consecrated, and he appointed. And I'm going to challenge you as you read this is to see if the shoe fits. Verse 6. Gee, we're making real progress tonight. I should warn some of you that are new, we don't go at this pace through 52 chapters or we'd be here through 1998. Uh, but sometimes it's slow getting started. We, we, we will not be quite this tedious as we go. And I've also told you more than I know, so there won't be all this background as we were. Okay. Um, verse 6. But then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. It's reminiscent of Exodus 4 and Moses, right? I cannot speak, for I am a slow of speech and of a slow tongue and all this. Remember Moses trying to cop out? The Lord says, Who made man's mouth, right? Well, Jeremiah tries to pull that stunt. He says, uh, see, God says, before, the Lord came to me saying, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet of the nations. With that kind of a declaration out of the mouth of the Creator himself, I don't know how to handle that. I mean, that's got to be tough. But then Jeremiah, maybe call it chutzpah, I don't know. Then he said, then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. He's trying to cop out. Now, by the way, the word child here, that's again one of these words that in your English you stumble at, because it sounds like he's saying I'm a little kid. The word is nar, and it's also used in Genesis 14 of the men of Abraham's army. Huh? And it's also used of Absalom at, uh, during his rebellion in 2 Samuel 18. So it's youth, but don't, don't get the impression of a child child it's youth like he's you know under 30 okay but he is he's young he's young for the call what his point being that he feels he's he's immature for the role that god is calling him to verse 7 hmm. but the lord said unto me say not i am a child for thou shalt go to all that i shall send thee and whatsoever i command thee thou shalt speak and I have a feeling that's known as being having it explained more clearly. Yeah. It's like I hear that as saying, when I say jump, you ask how high, you know. And the Lord said and the Lord said to me, Say not on a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now you can you can treat that as sort of a reprimand, or you can treat that as a prophecy. Now when God prophecies out that way, the distinction becomes quite academic. Um, verse 8, be not afraid of their faces. Now, here's the, the good news. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. In other words, you're going to be my vehicle, Jeremiah. Now, it's interesting when he says he just touched his mouth. It's a lot more somehow humane than what Isaiah went through. If you remember the coals and the from the altar and, my, and all this business. Um, 
I'm not going to make a big thing of it. It's just uh, it, it, there's a parallel, and yet it's different. Okay. It just dawns on me, and it might have been the same, and Jeremiah just didn't choose to elaborate. I don't know. In any case, though, it's clear that there's no guesswork going on. And Jeremiah spoke as God specifically, expressly instructed him. And he also gave him uh, the comfort of the protection. And it's going to be clear as we go that he enjoyed that. And what I mean by that, not that he took, took joy in it, but he had the benefit of, of, of that protection because Jeremiah goes through uh, adversities continually. And uh, all the way through, what's impressive is Jeremiah never wavers. He really hangs in there. He evidences not just God's words, but that relationship. And uh, that's the one thing that's going to come through, and that's what makes him such a spiritual giant as we really understand what's going on. Now, verse 11, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? There's going to be a couple of little object lessons coming here. Jeremiah uses a, seems to be a lot of drawing upon nature, and here's one of them. He says, Jeremiah says, What seest thou? And he said, I see the root of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me a second time, saying, What seest thou? And he said, I see a boiling pot, and its face is toward the north. The Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against its walls round about against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and have worshipped the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Boy, what a comfort, but he's going to need it couple of quick remarks, because we're running out of time. The almond thing. This is one of those places where in the English, and I'll try to catch this where I can, you may wonder, what's this almond tree? That's sort of me. You know, what's that all about? Well, the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what sees that? He says, behold, I see the rod of an almond tree. So he beholds an almond tree, and you wonder, well, what's that got to do with anything? Okay. And the Lord said unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Two things that you don't know that help unravel this. The almond tree blooms in January. That's the middle of winter. It blooms early. It's considered a precursor to spring. When the almond tree blooms, you know spring is coming. But that's called a real leading indicator. You know, it ain't just around the corner. It's coming, but it's coming, coming, you know. So that's, that's probably the main, you know, you say, what do you see? He says, well, I see an almond tree. And the Lord says, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. In other words, the almond tree is used as a figure of some, as a harbinger of something coming. But what you also don't realize is that there's a play on words. Almond tree is seged, which is almond tree. Soged means God is watching. Okay, so there's, a, the, the almond, there's also a pun of sorts. In the Hebrew, there's a word play. You see, that's why the Lord can say, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten to perform it. The almond tree is almost sounds the same. It's like a pun. Yes, it's an almond tree, but it's also, the word can mean, He's watching. The Lord is watching over this, and He's going to make it happen. That's what's, what's suggested there, to be fulfilled. And the other thing down here, He says, the word came again a second time. He says, What do you see? And he says, I see a boiling pot with its face toward the north. That's misleading as it's translated. Its face... From the north, it's pouring to the south. It sounds the way we would say it, you know, with its face to the north, you get the impression that it was going to dump further over and dump to the north. No, it's got backwards. He's looking toward the north, but it's facing this way, south. And when you realize that, then the whole thing makes sense. Okay? You need to recognize something else that's not obvious. If you study a map, you'll be confused because Babylon ain't northward. But its path to Israel is because they go on the crescent because the impassable desert. So, so the Babylonians in attacking Israel will come from the north. So uh, the Lord says, uh, yes, out of the north, 
and evil shall break forth upon the inhabitants of the land. But this is an evil of the Lord's doing for judgment. You see, that's the part that Jeremiah understands and comes forth because it sounds strange that he keeps preaching for these guys to yield to this evil from the north because it's God's hand. God's hand is in it. For lo, I will call the families of the kings of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come and shall set everyone his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. In other words, that's, that's where he did the city business was at the gates. So they're, they're going to be in charge is what he's saying. And against all the walls around about and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness. Who have forsaken me, have burned incense to other gods, and have worshipped the works of their own hands. Oh, uh, idols didn't happen. They were the works of man's hands. So you can worship idols, not just by lighting candles to some creature on a little hearth in the back room of your house. When you worship the works of your own hands, secular humanism, boy, aren't we great. Look what our society has done. Our technologies are this or that, what have you. Is that where we take our comfort or our goals? That doesn't mean that achievement isn't worth pursuing. Have it help our society if we fail to develop people who have a drive and a skill to achieve. I'm not, but we don't worship it. In our society, we do. That's idolatry. That's the root cause of all the things that beset our nation. Form of idolatry. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee, you Jeremiah, this day a fortified city and iron pillar and bronze walls. Coming out of the word, uh, the word of the Lord. That's strong idioms. Against what? But this is the scary part. Lord saying, I'm going to protect you. What are you going to protect me against? The whole land. Oh, really? In other words, you begin to realize what's coming up against them. Against the kings of Judah. Against its princes. Against its priests. Against the people of the land. The good news is God is going to protect them against that. I don't mean to sound flippant or, or, or cynical. But if I was Jeremiah hearing that, I'd say... I'd rather pass. <laughs> I think of Tigvi and Fiddler on the Roof, you know. Can't you just have somebody else be chosen for a while, you know? <laughs> and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Now, frankly, I, I can't help but infuse my own, perhaps, levity there. But the truth of the matter is, as you get to know Jeremiah, you discover that he embraced that, took refuge in it, and was an unflinching, unfailing prophet that succeeded spiritually because of the relationship, but because of his ability to take on that. Isaiah speaks of the salvation of the Lord, Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord, Daniel, the kingdom of the Lord, Jeremiah, the judgment of the Lord. And he's going to have much to say about that. Uh, let's stand.